Hi, welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. On this episode, we're going to talk with the creators behind the Accessible Stall podcast, Emily Ladau and Kyle Katadurian. We're going to talk with them about the details of what they're creating, why, and the importance of having more disabled media creators in our world. But before we jump in, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. And if you'd like to get in deeper conversation, you can join me on my private Facebook group called Victoriously Living. And if you'd like to see more from One Lego Productions, please support us at patreon.com forward slash One Lego Productions. Emily, Kyle, thank you so much for joining me on Chair Chats. I'm super excited to have you here. Emily, I kind of met you. Actually, we didn't really meet. I just saw you from afar and admired you from afar at the Reef Summit in February um, and was uh, just uh, inspired by the way you speak. Um, the way you carry yourself and present yourself. And I went ahead and started um, seeing what you do and came to find out you actually create a, created a podcast called The Accessible Stall with Kyle here. And I wanted to let our audience know about it because I've enjoyed listening to it. I think it's um, really insightful and offers a spectrum of perspectives for people throughout the disability community. And I wanted people to understand what it is, um, who you guys are, and why you created it. So who wants to start? Well, I have to say one thing first, which is that I kept seeing you around at the Reeve Summit, and I'm not, I'm not making this up. I was like, she looks like she's cool and important, so I don't think I should go up to her. <laughs> Truth be told, I was really intimidated by you, too. I was like, oh, oh my, my gosh. gosh. She's so, so cool. So we should have been best friends by right now. I know. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. You can just imagine the two of you, like, side-eyeing each other from across the room and, like, being hesitant yeah, like, to walk, to go up to the other one. <laughs> yeah. I do that, though. I'm afraid to go up to people. Really? Like, if I'm with Kyle and we're in a group, like, I won't – I need to be with him. Yeah, Really? I'm the same way though. Like I, you, you give me confidence. I don't have. Really? <laughs> so, cause you guys on the accessible stall podcast seem so confident and comfortable with each other that, you know what, honestly, it's good to know that deep down we feel this way because media creators in front of, or behind the microphone or in front of the camera, whatever it is we're producing, it can seem like we have all this confidence and we got it all together. But <laughs> we're just we're just people, and we're gonna talk about that. Talk about the importance and of people stepping up and stepping out to become media creators. But I do want people to know about the accessible stall because I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Yes, I totally derailed that by my weird <laughs> fangirl moment. But I'm gonna let Kyle give the summary of what it is and what we do and then I can jump in because I feel like he's more succinct than I am. Oh, uh, we're just two friends talking about hot button disability issues. That's what we do. <laughs> um, but why we do it, I think at the time especially, Emily and I noticed that there was a niche that was that existed, but that wasn't filled. So we kind of like put ourselves in that little crevice. And um, since then, there have been other disabled podcasters, and, there and we certainly weren't the first. Um, but I think that our show is a very unique blend of perspective, simply because although Emily and I are both people with disabilities, um, and we have similar philosophies, um, we have uh, different quote-unquote ability levels, and we have differences in how we reach the goals that we both strive to achieve when it comes to disability rights. 
see, he said it better than I would. I would have given you our entire life story. Like I was born on July 29th and then I met Kyle. No. <laughs> Although Kyle and I were born two weeks apart. Yeah. So it was basically fate. I mean, come on. Right. Right. <laughs> exact same year. Yep. Really? Mm-hmm. Too bad you guys weren't like in the next delivery room. we might as well have been um (laughs) because we ended up being attached at the hip once we became friends but the podcast became our way of taking arguments that we have and putting them on the internet (laughs) okay well you know what arguments don't have to be like drag out hair pulling you know, you're wrong, I'm right. It could just be a sharing of opinions in a respectful way. And that's what I do love about the accessible stall. And Kyle, you mentioned that there was, you felt like there was something missing. You and Emily felt like there was a gap. What was that gap that you felt was missing? In my opinion, the gap that we filled um, actually is in the way that we produce our show. Um, first of all, there's not enough disability centered and created content anywhere. Um, but of, of the stuff that there is, um, it's either very esoteric or it's very like, it sounds like a lecture Mm -hmm. and Emily and I wanted to be the people that, you know, if you didn't know about disability stuff or things related to our world, um, we wanted to, we wanted to make it conversational and accessible to people who weren't already in the know okay. about these kinds of issues. I would totally echo that because one thing that I have always found alienating is that we talk about disability with a lot of jargon sometimes because that's how we're told to understand it. And so while Kyle and I both recognize that Um, in a lot of ways we come from privileged backgrounds and we can't speak to every aspect of disability or every aspect of having multiple um, identities that are marginalized. We can take a lot of the conversations that are missing from mainstream media and help people have a way to frame them. And also another piece of feedback that we get a lot is something that Kyle touched on earlier, how there wasn't a lot of disabled content creators out there. So people come to us and they're like, we feel like you see us. We wanted to talk back to you while you were having this conversation because nobody wants to talk to us about this stuff. And you're talking and we love that someone is having a conversation about it. So it's as much about education as it is about making other people feel seen. Right. Why do you think that? Why do you think that they that your podcast has the ability to draw people in a in a way that's so personal and intimate? I mean, I think it's because we are just having a conversation. We're just two people having a conversation. I think that we I hope don't come across as intimidating, although I've learned that's not the case in person, but <laughs> um <laughs> Kyle, I mean, would would you agree? Yes, but I would say I think a lot of it is also our personal relationship because I, I really do feel like that comes through every episode. I really do. And I think that because we're so like friendly with each other and comfortable with each other, that that sets the tone for the people listening as well to feel comfortable Um, in providing feedback or confiding in us or whatever they might be doing. So I think between those two things, um, yeah, that's why Yeah, it feels so comfortable. It's so interesting. I might age myself right now, but I don't know if any of you guys remember the show Allie McBeal. Mm. Okay, so I loved Allie McBeal because there were such neurotic characters on there, but I felt like they said everything that people want to say, but were too afraid to say because of societal norms right like if someone bumps into you you don't go off on them but they would and i'm like yes i just and so i could see that through you guys people are like that's exactly how i feel that's exactly what i want to say and so in essence you're like a 
a self-expression of the people that you represent. And I, I love that. And, um, you know, one of the, what I hope, I hope to also do that through One Leg Up Productions. Um, and I guess for me as a media creator, it was in response to why are we waiting for permission from the mainstream media to represent us? We could just do it ourselves. And um, what I love about the media space and what you said, Emily, about you can't represent every single person within the disability community, but you can do your part. And that leads to why there is more, there's a need for more media creators with disabilities out there because I don't know what it's like to be deaf and gay and black all at the same time, right? Like I, I don't know those things, um, but someone who does have that experience can bring that to the forefront and um, make those people feel like, yes, that's me too. Um, and so where do you feel are more gaps that people with disabilities may be able to see, I could fill that gap as a media creator? Well, I think you have to back up first to the point where we were talking a little bit about, you know, feelings of confidence before. And I think that first you have to grapple with why me? Why is my story important? Who wants to hear my story? Who wants to hear what I have to say? And I think once you grapple with that, then it's a little bit easier to start pinpointing the gaps. I mean, the thing about what we do on the accessible stall is we take the conversations about, you know, big topics or current events that people aren't talking about and have that conversation. So whether we're talking about sex and disability or we're talking about the fact that, you know, it's important to pay people with disabilities for their work or we're talking about the fact that, um, you know, there's ableism in a small town in I think it's like Wales because they're designing inaccessible bathrooms, public bathrooms. Like we want to talk about it all. So it's not even that you have to identify certain gaps in, in conversation. It's that you should feel comfortable knowing that disability relates to everything in this world in some way. And so the major gap is disability as a whole. We try to insert that into conversations where we feel like it's missing or that perspective is missing. Um, and again, we're not authorities on anything. You know, we don't speak for every disabled person, but we're two people who have a lot to say. <laughs> would you echo that? I would. And it's particularly like when you brought up the episode of the inaccessible bathrooms, like, you know, as a listener, like is everywhere but when we were recording that we were doing it from a place of you know man these bathrooms are kind of like they're pointless there's no good reason for this anywhere and even if you're not disabled this affects you um and that's another to to echo emily's point that is something that we very very constantly strive to achieve on our show um is making sure that what we're saying doesn't only um, resonate with people with disabilities, although we love when it does. So do you know what your audience is? Do you know if the majority are disabled? I don't know if you have the demographics on that. You know, I think it's been a while since we looked at them because we would look at demographics when we were doing um, stuff around sponsorship, but I don't know if we actually have those specific details, but it's something that we talk about a lot that we're not really trying to reach one direction or the other in terms of disabled or non-disabled. We just want everyone to feel, as cheesy as this is, welcome in the accessible stall. Yeah. Why accessible stall? Why that title? I think it was just because we were brainstorming and, uh, I made a joke about how people 
especially, you know, often the women who I know go to the bathroom in giant groups and they have these deep conversations in the bathroom. And so I was like, yeah, let's have our deep conversations in the bathroom in this accessible place where we can all join. I don't know. It's so silly, but it's stuck. Am I remembering that right? Something like that. I mean, I just remember when you first came up with it, how excited you were because it was an instant, like we just knew from the moment that you said it, that that was going to be the name of our show. Yeah. I think we were just spitballing and that, that really like was the one. And now we have like a dozen backstories as to where it came from. (laughs) As a woman, I can totally relate. I don't know what it is about the bathroom with deep conversations, but um, I, I think it's brilliant. I was like, is it the bathroom stall? Is it a wheel ch- a parking stall? I'm not really sure, but brilliant name. What would you say to somebody who is thinking about having, like, creating a podcast or a YouTube channel or something and they're feeling like scared or nervous? How would you encourage them? Do it. Do it, do it, do it. So many people, and I think even we were like this in the beginning, so many people think that they need to have a certain type of equipment or a certain, like a defined idea or something like that. There's always like something that people will convince themselves that they need that they don't have in order to not do something. And we have been there. You just have to do it. You can get more equipment later. You can refine your ideas over time. And another thing that I'll say is that people will come. You know, when we first put out our show, we put out three episodes to nobody. <laughs> and we, we had a following fairly quickly. It wasn't overnight, but it, it, it grew. So as long as you have the confidence to put stuff out there, then th- that's all you really need. Okay. And consistency too, I would say. We promoted on our personal social media channels. I mean, we weren't, and this was a a few years ago at this point already. So, you know, um, we both definitely didn't have as many connections and we said, this is something we want to do. Let's just do it. I mean, sometimes people start things with the goal of getting an audience and that's important, but if there's no passion and desire behind it to actually do the thing, no matter who's watching, then it's just, it's not as worth it. You know, I mean, I think when people start a podcast and they're hoping they're going to go viral overnight and get millions of listeners, that's awesome and great, but that's probably not realistic. So it really helped us that we were like, we want to do this. We enjoy it. And the listeners will come when they come, whoever they are. And that's been the driving force for us. Yeah. And also Kyle's right about equipment too, because everyone's like, Oh, do I need to get a microphone? Do I need to pay for fancy, expensive software? I don't know how to edit. Like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of work behind it, but there also are a lot of ways to get started and know that your quality is going to get better over time as you learn. Don't let the fact that you're a novice be something that completely stops you because, you know, then I don't think anybody would put their words out there and everybody's got to start somewhere. I mean, people ask Kyle and I, if we record in a studio, they've asked us this before. And it's like, we're in our living room in our pajamas. (laughs) So the exact opposite of a studio. Yeah. So, I mean, don't, don't let all of these technicalities stop you. And I should qualify or clarify, like, I know we're making it sound like, oh, just do it. It's going to be fun. Like, it's also work. And I'm very lucky that I happen to be partnered up with somebody on this project who knows what they're doing when it comes to some of the more technical aspects of things. Like, it helps to have a friend who yeah. knows how to do that stuff. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's all on me. After I do the show, I'm going to edit it, upload it, close caption it. Like there's a, it's a lot, it's a process, but it is, I think you're right. Having the passion behind it. And it's interesting because on my Facebook group, I, um, 
it's called Victoriously Living, and I post different things about what does a life of victory look like, and this week is passion, and passion is a, is uh, originates from the Latin form, and it means to endure, right, and there are, when you're passionate about something, it's not like, oh, I'll never have to work a day in my life again, rainbows and roses all over the place, it's like, okay, I'm willing to put the work in and sacrifice you know, sitting and watching Netflix or going out with my friends to get this done because I have such a passion for it. Um, and passion is one of those things that will help us get over obstacles. What obstacles do you feel you've run into? So maybe it helps someone going through the journey that maybe they can help prepare themselves for. I know I can say that there have been a couple of times where we've messed up in something that we've done or something that we've said, and that's an obstacle of our own making, but it's also one that I would say has provided a learning experience for us. So we're now more passionate than ever about making sure that what we're doing is really respectful towards everyone and doesn't accidentally or unintentionally, you know, become dismissive of someone's experience or anything like that. So we're constantly in a learning process with this. And I think especially when you're talking about minority identities and experiences, it can definitely be challenging because everybody comes at it from a different angle and a different personal experience. But for us, you know, we've been able to turn those into learning experiences. That's, that's what I would say is a big one. I'm sure there are others that I'm missing. I think the biggest obstacle for me, at least initially, was like self-doubt. I would say, um, just to go back to the previous question, just for a second, uh, something very important is you should make stuff that you'd want to listen to or make stuff that you'd want to watch or however you make your content. And at least when we first got started, that was my biggest obstacle because I don't know about you, Emily, but I was like, who in the world is going to want to listen to me talk about anything? Um, but to echo Emily's point, um, she's absolutely right. Whenever we're talking about a subject that we that we are even slightly uncomfortable with, which we do every once in a while, um, we say right at the top, we say like, we're probably going to get something wrong. Uh, please let us know. And we open ourselves to feedback. And if we get some, we follow it. Or we do some research and follow it. And, you know, we as a very seriously. Yeah, yeah. And it should be. I mean, as a media creator, you're putting yourself out there as a voice to, whether you like it or not, lead and be an example of. Um, and, you know, but that can scare people too, right? Like, they're like, oh, I don't want to say anything wrong. And everyone's looking at me and then I just did it all out in public. <laughs> right? So, um, there's that fear too. What I mean, I, I myself have that. How, what would you, what would you say to me? So something that I have reminded myself over and over again, um, and something that we've especially been focusing on right now is knowing when to pass the microphone, knowing when you can comment on something, but it's not your place to put yourself front and center in the conversation, knowing when it's your time to amplify the voices of other people and when it's time for you to sort of step back and, you know, help put the focus on the issue at hand. And so for us, that's been something that we've been trying to work on. If we don't know about something, we're not going to say that we're experts on it. We're going to say, hey, here's someone who knows what they're talking about, you know, and invite them in to have a conversation. So that's something that's really important to us is acknowledging that we might get it wrong. We're not the experts, but we're open, we're listening, we're learning, and most importantly, we know when it's not about us and when it's time 
to ensure that the focus is on someone else. And so, you know, and that's not something that I'm saying because we need to be like patted on the back for it. It's something that we have very actively had to learn and practice over time. Yeah. And I think it's important that people I feel like are willing to give you grace if you're willing to step up and say, you know what, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm human. I can make mistakes. Um, and if you can, <laughs> you know, I will learn and feel free to correct me, uh, you know, and just put yourself out there. I mean, because we may think we're saying the right thing and realize that we just put our foot in our mouth. And so um, it's okay to invite our community to also let us know that. And I, I feel like that essentially is what every media creator does is build a community of people um, mm -hmm. that are like-minded um, and enjoy listening to what you have to say. Um, and so with your community, are there other ways that people can interact? Because, you know, people come together for you guys, but maybe there are things that they want to say. Like they said, that I'd love to like chime in in the conversation and, you know, are there other ways that they can participate with you or within your accessible stock community? We've had some pop in Facebook comment sections on our, yeah, it hasn't happened in quite a while. Um, largely, I think because we haven't done anything super controversial, uh, but we've also definitely gotten some people going in the Facebook comments, that's for sure. And we're on Twitter too, you know, and I think that for us right now, it's, it's more about knowing that they can interact with us as they see fit, but if they just want to take it in and they don't feel like they have anything to say, that's okay too. You know, we'll start a conversation and if you want to continue the conversation, we're here to keep it going. And how do you come up with your conversations, your content? Uh, man, actually, I, I was going to give a funny answer, but the real answer is it starts off with a seed of an idea. And then over like the course of a couple of days, Emily and I will mull it over and shape it into what could be a podcast episode. And then what we do is if we find ourselves talking too much about something, we will tell the other one to shut up and then set a time to record where we will have the conversation we were in the middle of having. And honest to goodness, those are our best episodes. So we'll be messaging because uh, we like text back and forth all the time. And we'll be like, oh, man, that's a really good episode idea. So we'll be like talking about it. And then we'll be like, wait, we're having way too much of a conversation about this right now. Like we need to, we need to stop having this conversation via text and we need to take it onto a podcast so that we don't say everything that we have to say and then it gets forced and redundant. Or we'll be in the middle of a podcast so that's, that's the one where it's like podcast within a podcast where we'll be like, huh, we just mentioned something that could be a whole other episode. Stay tuned. We'll eventually do an episode on that. And then we probably forget to do an episode on that. Oh, we're so <laughs> bad at keeping track of our ideas. We are constantly going, hey, what was that great idea that we had like three months ago that we definitely did not write down? We are, it's not, it's not a great system. We have a spreadsheet. We're just really bad because we usually end up coming up with ideas when we're like in the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, how appropriate. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> the thing about it just relaxes you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, so any final words that you would like to impart on someone that's toying with the idea of becoming a media cre creator? And I want people to know that being a media creator could look like different things. It could look like a video like this. It could look like a podcast where it's just audio, like the accessible stall. It could look like writing and editorial for different websites or your own, like your own blog, right? It's all media. So whatever your personality is, like there's a space for you. So on our show, uh, we call this final takeaways. <laughs> um, I think my my final takeaway in this moment is definitely that you might find yourself feeling like your story is not important. And I have been there many times before where we live in a world that tells you that 
if you are part of any marginalized community that your story is not important. But I fundamentally don't believe that's true. I believe that what you have to say is important. I believe that you shouldn't necessarily share your story at the expense of others or, you know, speak over other people. I believe that you should know when to step back and when to listen and learn and apologize and and correct things. But at the same time, don't let anybody tell you that your story is not important because we need more people with disabilities creating stories and telling their own stories and putting them out there. So do it. That's my takeaway. Okay. What about Kyle? I, I genuinely cannot follow it up. Emily is absolutely right. And I echo every single one of her words. <laughs> and just so you know, that almost never happens on our show. So this is a bit of a... <laughs> <laughs> no, or you but... always say that you do. And then you're like, wait, actually, no, this is my takeaway. <laughs> no. Yeah, she's right. That's way more accurate. <laughs> but, I, but I do think you're right. You know, don't ever think your story doesn't matter. It does. Somebody will relate to it. I promise you. There, there, somebody, you are not alone. And the, the best way that we found that out was to start the show. Mm, that's beautiful. Oh, wow. I love that. Okay. So my takeaways from what you guys said is if you are even thinking about having um, a space where you can be a media creator, you have to have passion. Um, you have to be willing to make mistakes, apologize, know when to step back, um, and allow others to speak. Um, know that you matter, know that you're not alone. Um, and if you build it, they will come essentially field of dreams, people. (laughs) I mean, if you build it, they will come knowing that the building takes work. Hmm. Yeah. But it's important work. That's true. It's meaningful work. Yeah. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Um, it, where, how can people find you, start listening to you guys? Well, you can find <laughs> us at theaccessiblestall.com. You can find us on Facebook at The Accessible Stall. You can find us on Twitter just at Accessible Stall. And let's see, are there other places on the interwebs? No. And That's anywhere it. there's a podcast. You oh, oh well, yeah, I mean, all, the, all the podcast platforms. <laughs> okay. We, we forgot the most important one, <laughs> which is very on brand for us. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Um, hopefully this has been an encouragement to you, the viewer. If you're dappling with the idea, just do it. It is there's so much to be grateful for when you do it. And you know, I know it takes courage and commitment, but it was well, it is well worth it for you to do that. So um, I'd love for you to comment below. Let me know what your ideas are, ideas are in terms of what you'd like to do a show on, whether it be a podcast or a blog or a video YouTube channel. I'd love to hear the ideas. Um, And as a disability, part of the disability community, what I love is that we support each other, right? And it's a great opportunity for all of us to champion each other and be each other's cheerleaders. So Thank you guys for joining Chair Chats. Everybody tune in to the Accessible Stall. Great content. I want to also remind you to please subscribe and share. If you would like to join my community, you can do that on Facebook. It's called Victoriously Living. And if you like what you see, support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you so much. And until we meet again, be blessed.